Okay, we're glad you're here. Um, of course, we used as a hook the uh, hit movie, the second biggest movie ever by Netflix, Don't Look Up. And uh, we're just curious, well, if you haven't seen the movie, and a lot of you probably haven't, it uses the story that there's a comet coming to Earth that's gonna destroy Earth, and these scientists discover it and try to get the world to act. That's the premise of it. Of course, it is an analogy for addressing climate change and uh, kind of an interesting way to look at the whole issue. And we wanted to use it as a hook to think about how we can solve this kind of challenge. Um, so we wanted to ask you a second question. For those of you who've seen it, um, if you saw it, what did you appreciate about this movie? And maybe no spoilers because there are people who haven't seen it, but a short answer. See if you can put it into five or six words really briefly because we're going to try to read them back. And if you're just arriving, please go to poll ev. You can see the address at the top of this screen. Open up another browser window and we'll be using this polling software to get some of your input because this is an interactive workshop. So someone appreciated that it opens a conversation on climate change, the obvious parallel with the climate emergency you identified with the frustration. Janet, are you open to reading some of these? I'm going to protect my wife. Yeah, get another voice in here if you're game. Sure. Um, if you saw Don't Look Up, what did you appreciate about it? Identified with the frustration, honesty of the scientists. Scientists sometimes cannot communicate very well, <laughs> sadly. The emotional roller coaster of being seen as chicken little. The absurdity of how removed we are from things that actually matter. Don't sh didn't sugarcoat the ending. Hey, no spoilers. Wait. Re might not be a spoiler. Who knows? <laughs> Recognize the frustration to reach out to make people attentive to the urgency. Um, why talking about the science doesn't work. It was funny and got people talking about climate change. The audacity, humor, star power to get the message across. I felt seen. The parallels with what is actually happening right now, inaction from dumb reasons in front of an urgent threat. No sugarcoating of the realities of the social circumstances. How we are so enthralled by social media. These are great. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. So basically, this is great that you get the premise you, I think might have, many of you were as charmed as we were. And we wanted to just note, uh, actually, I'll just give a little another note. We're, of course, with Climate Interactive. You just heard from Janet Tchaikovsky, Yes Means Zahar, I'm Andrew Jones. We work closely with MIT Sloan's management schools, their sustainability initiative. And really the spark for this, I'm showing this picture because in the middle of it, Leo Leonardo DiCaprio and this character, Dr. Randall gave his second speech to everybody. And it was just this unhinged rant on this morning show. And I, when I heard it the first time, it just brought tears to my eyes, having given that rant before and had the same failure of it helping. And I actually, <laughs> on a Saturday, I sat down and I, I wrote down the whole thing. I was just so moved by it. In the middle of it, kind of here on page three, he said, how can we even talk to each other about this? He was just like, how can we even talk to each other? And we're here with Climate Interactive because we have a proposed way to talk to each other about the climate crisis. And the overall premise of it is that we think that with interactive facilitated simulators, we can have a kind of a open book kind of conversation with people who really disagree with one another about what's going on and what really needs to be done. And so we're here to give you that experience of what we think is a good way to talk to each other, but also um, offer you a tool to do it with other people. It's addressing the main challenge that our partner in our work at MIT, John Sturman said, research shows that showing people research doesn't work. 
Research shows that showing people research doesn't work. It also shows that engaging them in grounded science simulators does work. So that's what we're here for. We have this vision that in the future, we're gonna see rapidly falling emissions in a thriving world. That is our vision of Climate Interactive. And how we do it is we create and we share simulators that lead to effective policy, policy that's actually gonna work and is equitable. So along the way, we're helping people with other things that matter on health and justice and the economy and other things that really matter to people. So that's why we're here at Climate Interactive. What we're gonna do today is go through the core of this workshop that we think you could lead for other people if you want. You'd have to take, you should take the training course. Yazzie, can you send people the link to that for them to go check it out? We have a free online training course to lead this workshop. The workshop is pretty straightforward. Where are we headed? What can we do? What would you love about a better future? And what are you gonna do about it? At an hour, we're gonna stop. After that, we really love to tell some stories about who's using this in different places. We're gonna answer a lot of questions. There are a bunch of directions that we can go. Along the way, if you do have any questions, there's this really good Q and A box in Zoom where you can type them. Some of them, Yazzie or someone on the team is gonna be able to answer quickly. However, some of them are gonna to need to get submitted to a more formal support page that we have where you can ask more technical questions. But along the way, and if you have a question for me and Janet, please write into Q&A and we'll get to them. Oh, here's that course that uh, Yazzie might be sending you to. All right, what we're gonna be doing, of course, is testing our thinking and learning with our simulator and rows. And here it is. Um, Yazzie, if you would, would you just send people a link to the main one here, send them to this. And so what it is, is a way for you to test actions. So what you can see is if you can imagine a world with a lot of energy efficiency, it's going to run very quickly and allow you to see what is the impact of any action that's being taken. That's the reason it can be so effective at grounding a conversation in real time. But before playing with the simulator, I wanna know what's on your minds that we ought to be really testing? What's, uh, what are your interests? And I'm gonna start, start it off with this question. So if you would go to Poll Everywhere, back to your polling um, software and answer this question. What are some policies that people think are high priority or you hear message companies and proper, you know, that being advertised as high priority, but you think they're not. Shift to nuclear energy, carbon capture, sure there's gas carbon capture and coal carbon capture and bioenergy carbon capture, carbon pricing. Some people say, you're saying that was one, planting trees, carbon capture and storage, recycling, I'm writing some of these down. These are great. Electric vehicles, planting trees, more planting trees. Boy, this one's really popular. Oh my gosh. Is this one person typing fast? Uh, turning lights off, just active cons con conservation. More, boy, this tree one is really big. So keep typing. This is really helpful. Maybe regenerative agriculture, maybe not important, huh? Shift to nuclear energy. Well, it looks like these folks want to hear about trees. Oh my gosh. <laughs> okay. Well, there's a consensus. Uh, deforestation for solar fields. Interesting. Okay. Let's go test some of these. Clean coal. So we'll go back and do some more for our second round. But what we want to do is look and say, in this world, in a minute, we're going to plant some trees and see what it does. But first, I want to tell you and just get you grounded in just the, the basics of what's going on here in this baseline. And in this baseline story, what you can see, your eyes probably go to 3.6. This is the temperature in Celsius, 2100, where the goal is for this to be well below two degrees, ideally 1.5. And let's look at that, that graph. And I, I just clicked on this button right here. Do you see that grid? This shows our favorite 12 graphs. And over on the right, you'll see temperature change. 
the blue line going up, up, up. Here we are today, 2022. We're about 1.3 degrees above 1850 temperature, passing two degree, 1.5, passing two all the way to 3.6. Why? Well, I'm going to go back to our favorite graphs because of greenhouse gas net emissions. Why might you say, are we getting this pollution? This is the stuff that you put it in the air, particularly the carbon dioxide collects, acts like a blanket over earth, trapping heat. So why are we seeing all of this? The main driver is coal, oil, and gas emissions of CO2. And go over to the left and you notice I just click on the title and it brings up all the graphs that we could have, over a hundred graphs. If you go to CO2 emissions, and click on that, the best one here to show the big problem, CO2 emissions by source area. Click on the three dots and you can do cool things with the graph. Like you can grab the data and put it into your own Excel spreadsheet if you want to, but you can hit view larger. This is designed to have a facilitator in the front of a room with two people, 20 people, 20,000 people watching. And here you can see it really large and you can see here are the main sources of pollution that has caused the problem to date and will continue to cause it unless we do something about it. And you can see the narrow band at the bottom of land use and forestry. This is mostly from cutting down trees, Brazil, Indonesia, for agriculture, for palm oil, et cetera. And then here in brown is coal. On top of it is oil. Blue is gas and bioenergy all the carbon dioxide going into the atmosphere. So this is the main cause of climate change. I'm gonna click that button, we'll get back to where we get our energy. And so it's the energy that is the driver. There's the coal, oil, and gas. This is now how much energy is being produced. And the good news is that growing wedge of green wind and solar on top of it, that has been growing really fast. And you can always go look and see each of these individual ones. I'm clicking here on the top and primary energy demand types and scrolling down to renewable primary energy demand. And you can see the amazing growth in wind and solar over time and is anticipated into the future. If you're curious, we can show you how we test that with others. And that testing is important. I just wanna say look, why we have confidence in a model like this. And we build it with the best available science with our partners at MIT using data from the IPCC, the International Energy Agency, and other sources. And many of those sources, you can see the sources and you can actually change many of the parameters in the model. If you go here and click on assumptions, so you click on assumptions, and underneath many of the assumptions in the model can be changed. For example, there's a really important number in here called the progress ratio. Every doubling of wind and solar, every doubling of nuclear or actually any energy source reduces its cost because of experience curves, a reinforcing positive feedback loop of learning and economies of scale. There's a number in the model. We explicitly model that learning. And so that number is 0.8. That means Every doubling of cumulative capacity of renewables drops the cost one minus 0.8 or 0.2, drops it a bit. You can see, my point there was, you can see where do we get these data? We get it from these studies, Junginer et al. So one reason you should have confidence in the model is you can see what the sources are. And actually, one thing with the sources is that you can go and see those sources and the whole report on the source. So one thing you might wanna do is to go here. This is the main CI website. If you're really curious, we have a, a whole guide about it. So if you go here to En-ROADS and scroll down, 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 and Yazzie, yes, if you would send this link to everybody, they could go see the En-ROADS reference guide. 432 of the most boring pages of reading you can imagine, which lay out all the equations and the parameters in the model. So you can go and see all of the sources of what's in it and really look at it yourself. But here we were back looking at this. You can see the sources. You can see the whole report. You can change these numbers. So if you think that this learning is too fast, you could have said, no, I think that that's too fast and we wouldn't learn as much. 
you can test different parameters and see what would the implication be. You can also compare, see how we compared our results against the really big integrated assessment models that sometimes take two or three days to run. They're very slow, they're very solid and important in our field. So what we do is we compare these results against them. For example, you click on this little triangle and down here you can see the calibration. This demand is calibrated to the world energy outlook, the shared socioeconomic pathways, the SSPs, or here for an eco another variable, greenhouse gas emissions, you can see many of the sources, okay? The other thing that we really like to do is compare our history. I was showing you about wind and solar. Well, really good news to see here is that the marginal cost of solar electricity has been falling. In 1990, look where it was, way up high. The yellow line is our simulated decrease in that cost. The red or the purple line is the actual data. So one way we build confidence is we compare our results against the actual data and then see, did we track it pretty well? The Lazard data in red over this last 10 years, comparing really helps us a good bit. So these are some of the methods that we use to build our confidence in the model. Okay, so we're really curious about afforestation. Told you about the baseline. This is the world, mind you that we don't forecast. We're not saying that this is our best guess. We're not in the forecast business. Go to the International Energy Agency and others for forecasts. We're in the learning business. We really wanna create a reasonable future against which to test policies and combinations of policies, like what if we grow a trillion trees? So we're gonna do that but I need to get your forecast first. What if we grow a trillion trees? Go back to poll everywhere and grow a trillion trees in your brain and tell me, what do you think temperature is gonna be? A trillion trees. Will it go under two degrees? Will it go to 2.5 to 2.9, three to 3.0, three, four to 3.6? I think a lot of you read the blog post we sent out or you see these other workshops. Well, this is why you suggested it may not be as high leverage. We can't get away with these tricks anymore, Janet and Yazzie. You figured us out. So 3.4 to 3.6. Now think, why is that? Why is that? Let's go try. So we don't really wanna look at energy here. I'm gonna to go to my favorite graphs again and pull up carbon removal. So think of what's critical about this is we're sending CO2 into the atmosphere, primarily burning coal, oil, and gas, releasing methane. We're also pulling carbon out of the atmosphere. And that is what we call net CO2 removal. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna plant a trillion trees. Now, mind you, under we click on these three dots and we get, we can change the percent available land used for afforestation. I'm gonna move that all the way up to 100 but I need to change the amount of land to get to a trillion trees. And this is one of those assumptions that we can change. Here we go, maximum land. And we did some math and it turns out that a trillion trees, to grow a trillion trees, you need 840 million hectares, a little bit more than our default assumption. So we're gonna increase this assumption a little bit. We haven't planted the trees yet. But one note is that we're going to say it's going to all the, it takes about 10 years, not for, for over 10 years, we'll find all the land necessary to do this. And over 30 years, we're going to be planting. We'll start planting in like year one, two, three, four, five. But it, over that whole time it takes, it won't all be done in, in five years. Over 30 years, we plant it. And we can test those, change those assumptions. Now, what we're going to watch is we're going to turn this up to, 100%. And over in the top left, we can see removals. We can see up to 7.85 gigatons per year removed. And I'm going to hit this little button at the top, replay last change, and I'll run it three times. And you can see the difference between not planting all those trees and planting the trees, not planting the trees and planting the trees. And maybe just to help us 
maybe I said that that was too long. Maybe it should be more like seven years. And maybe it'll only take 15 years, 14 years to uh, plant all those trees. Then it would get all the way up to 10 gigatons a year removal. But you go over to the right, and this is the pollution that causes warming, of course, greenhouse gas net emissions in black. What does it do? It only reduces these emissions that much. Not a lot, but also when does it reduce emissions, net emissions? Does it reduce emissions? It reduces net emissions. It only reduces net emissions in the 2050s. It is taking a long time, not just to find the land and plant the trees, but photosynthesis is pulling carbon out of the atmosphere into these trees and then storing it underground very, very slowly. Now you've probably seen the studies where scientists have said, we need to reduce emissions 50% by 2030. So in that case, see this graph right here. In this graph, that would mean that this blue line would be here. Do you see my uh, little arrow? But it's not reducing emissions out here until the 2050s. So the delay means that it's a relatively modest contribution. And like many of you guessed, only 3.4. It is no silver bullet. That said, we need to plant trees. We need to plant trees around the world. We need to build diverse ecosystems, forests that can support a whole range of biodiversity. What's being envisioned here for trillion trees is more like agriculture, more like plantations of fast growing trees, mostly dedicated to this carbon removal idea. Now, mind you, we may need to do some of it. It's a question of priority. Is this a top priority solution? We also should ask about equity. So any policy we put into here, we need to ask an important question. So go back to your poll question. What are some equity concerns? Ask this with everything, but here with afforestation. Go back to the poll question and answer, what are some equity considerations? That is helping people today and not just with reducing future temperature, but there are people around the world whose lives we need to lift up and help. Who would be displaced? There are people on land. Who would be displaced by this? What about, what kind of food production would be displaced? Food production, what is the effect on food prices and food availability? What about smallholder farmers whose livelihood depend on this? What would they be, do they be doing? Labor taken away from necessary labor, loss of land for farming. Where does the land come from? How will the poor be affected? You get it, ask these questions. Climate results, other equity and justice results. Intergenerational justice, yes. Health, race international connections. This is very important issues. All right, so, so many good answers. Let's go look when land, well, how much land are we talking about? I'm gonna click up here on this graph and under removals and land use, there are many graphs you can see, land for growing CO2 removal biomass. So that, and there, cause there's several types. One of them is afforestation. Oh my goodness. How much land are we talking about? This is, there's the 840 million acres, it's hectares. It is the combined land of China and the United States spread around the world. It is over two Indias, you see that dotted line. So this is a lot of land that would be required. What would happen to food production? Who lives on this land? How could this be done fairly? Now we're not saying it's wrong, we're just saying bring in some of these issues. So there's no, this is not a silver bullet. This is not a silver bullet. You identified it well. And I just can go back and I remember what you were saying before. Here's this first kind of um, example of a non-silver bullet. What are some others? Well, actually, if you would, Yazzie, would you? No, I need to send them this, actually. I'm gonna go back. I want you to see this graph yourself and be able to play with it yourself. So I'm going to go back to this. And one cool thing about En-ROADS is you can go up to this button and click share your scenario. Actually, I can just share it on Twitter. 
if I want really quick, here's a trillion trees climate scenario and tweet it out. So if you go to Twitter and look for that for Climate Interact, um, you're gonna see that tweet of this scenario. I can also, and we encourage you to do that, copy this scenario link. I'm gonna go into chat and I'm gonna send this to everybody. Um, go, you can go check out this scenario yourself. So click on that button, you will see this scenario yourself. So it leads us to ask, this is one of those things that is, gets talked about a lot that might need to be done, but perhaps is lower priority. What are some of those other things? And you listed many. I'm going to flip through some. I'm not going to take all the time to show you what's underneath the model and what's really driving it. That's going to take more time. I encourage you to do it or stay tuned because these are some of the things that we're really investigating. But I'm going to give you a hint. Go look at some of these things and research and development into a brand new energy supply. So what if we had thorium fission? What if fusion worked? Again, delayed because it takes so long. It's too late in the process for this to be a high priority. Look how little it reduces emissions, partly because it also uh, erodes energy efficiency efforts because of low energy prices. It also eats into renewables. Go try it yourself and try it yourself. Oh, try it. The others, CCS, carbon capture and storage. Perhaps coal CCS could help what's called, some people have tried to call clean coal, a relatively modest contribution it could make. Go test out coal CCS. You'll see similar results with gas CCS. Some of the others that could be looked at, people think, some people think more natural gas could help. Natural gas is a fossil fuel. So on net, and I'm just making a change, encouraging natural gas actually is not going to be a thing that helps in the long term. Another one for you to go try on your own in the model is to go test out electrification without decarbonization. So if all we do is electrify transport and electrify buildings and industry, relatively modest effect, partly because where does much of the world where is it? China's emissions of coal just went up when we thought they had peaked. Where would the world get more electricity if we had massive electrification? And I'm going to show you the challenge right now as we model it. It could be that absent things that keep coal and gas in the ground, electrification alone could be one of these low priority actions because it just leads to more coal more gas and not just more renewables and zero carbon energy. We need to make sure, and of course we can test many policies that would ensure that electrification works hand in glove with decarbonization. Those two things are necessary together. Okay, so those are just a couple tests of some of the things that you suggested before. But then I wanna move on quickly to say, all right, there's no silver bullet, we get it. There's no silver bullet what would actually work? So what I'm gonna do, let's move over here and let's do it this way. Um, go to poll everywhere and click on, you see how the model works now, right? You click to the right of the dot if you want more of it or the left of the dot if you want less of it. Click on the dot to show what you want. Oh, you're doing it. Less coal, more carbon price slower economic growth, more electrification, more energy efficiency, nuclear, natural gas, electrification, methane and other, this is great, you're getting it. Click on, the, click on there and see what it is. Boy, all this interested in carbon price. We have many people interested in carbon price, some carbon removal, fantastic. Energy efficiency, less coal, higher carbon prices. Boy, that's got a lot of green dots on it, doesn't it? A lot of green dots. Okay, well, I think you have spoken. I'm gonna go see about a carbon price. That said, I want you to think equity. 
how do we think about equity at the same time? So I'm going to go back to that same question and I'm going to clear responses. What are some equity considerations? I hope, let's see if this works. Oh, it's still giving me the farmer answer. Okay, uh, we're not gonna do that. Think, what are you concerned about if we have a high carbon price? I'm gonna put it in there at $100 a ton. $100 a ton is about 90 cents on a gallon of gas in the United States. What if that kind of carbon tax was there? What are your equity considerations? And we're going to look at them. But I'd also like you to think, what will that $100 a ton carbon price do to temperature? What will it do to the fuel mix? I'm going to click on the dots. Here comes $100 a ton. And boom all the way down to 2.9, all the way down to 2.9. Why is it helping so much? Now, the first thing I want to know, you to notice, one reason it helps is look at the timing. This is not keeping emissions out of the atmosphere in the 2040s. It's not keeping coal, oil, and gas in the ground in the 2040s and 2050s. If it can be done soon, it keeps CO2 out of the atmosphere here in the 2020s. And that timing is essential. Also, we can say, well, why does it help? Well, what is happening to various supplies? You can see it. I'll run it again. Look at the brown area of coal. Uh, gas shrinking. Oil shrinking in red, not quite as much. We also get more growth in wind and solar. There's also a way that the price demand feedback is helping us. What if you have a tax and if 80 cents a gallon gas, excuse me, 80 cents additional per gallon in gas, what happens to energy consumption? Energy efficiency is boosted. More people have an incentive to drive less, to take public transportation, carpool, buy efficient vehicles, buy electric vehicles, et cetera. Final energy consumption goes down relative to what it would have been otherwise. So these are some of the reasons that we get such a benefit out of a carbon price. That said, what is the equity consideration? I ran this at 7 a.m. this morning and people were so clear. I'll bet you are so clear as well. Maybe you're writing it in chat right now, but we're all really will need to solve the problem of energy prices going up. And Marginalized people in marginalized communities around the world play, pay a larger percentage of their income on their energy. What do we do about this? Well, many of the proposals that are out there say, let's look to the revenue generated by these carbon prices. And you can find that under financial revenue and cost from taxes and subsidies. And you can see that there are 3.2 trillion a year generated by that carbon price, 3.2 trillion a year that could be dividended back to people. Now there would be a big fight about this because Saudi Aramco and Exxon and Shell and Chevron said, would say this should be ours. Governments would say, no, we're gonna keep it. So there are a lot of debate about where that money goes and there would be a big battle. But this is some of the equity, these are some of the equity considerations that are really important. Overall though, this is pretty good news that there are strategies that really could deliver similar results. Just note that there are many ways to keep coal, oil, and gas in the ground. And I just want to note that we've added here and we're inspired by some of the conversations and many of you said less coal. Well, you could also just say, as increasingly happening, no more coal. We know what it's doing to our health to the people who live nearby, particularly disadvantaged community people. Look what would happen if we were able to just ban coal. Look at that drop over on the right if we stop building coal infrastructure and a huge cut in overall emissions and therefore temperature. You can do the same thing with, of course, natural gas. You scroll down here, stop building new gas infrastructure and explore what would be the result from a more production side action. And there's a whole movement, the 
fossil fuel non-proliferation treaty, a whole movement to try to get us to use less. There is the Beyond Oil and Gas Alliance. Yes, maybe you can send that link to the, the fossil fuel non-proliferation treaty um, if you can find it out there on the, on the web for folks. So this is some of the approaches to thinking about how to keep coal, oil, and gas in the ground. Now, mind you, there's some other ways that we can do it, not just on the production side or with a carbon price, but a combination of clean tech. Now, clean tech alone, even if we had more renewables and nuclear and new zero carbon, it's tough to really keep enough coal, oil, and gas in the ground just with this approach. Now, if we add in electrification, all this alternatives to addressing fossil fuels, they can really help um, as well. But put all this together, what's it really going to take? And I'm gonna go back to take a peek at what you suggested here. What did you suggest? And if we look at what was suggested with all these different actions, carbon pricing, less coal, less natural gas. It's interesting, no one literally looked at oil, but energy efficiency, not interest in electrification, slower growth, methane, carbon removal. What if we did all of those things? Less coal, less natural gas, high carbon price, more renewables, more energy efficiency. You can see we're now at 2.4. You didn't mention electrification. I'm gonna do more on energy efficiency. Someone said slightly lower economic growth. Methane and other, watch this one. Agriculture matters. The Global Methane Pledge in Glasgow, I got to see all those folks celebrate huge breakthroughs in methane. 2.3 goes to 2.0. Now I wanna note, why is it not even more? Some think that a huge cut in methane and other gases would bring half a degree. It's important to look and see, well, what's happening to methane already in this scenario? Already what's happening? Methane? Whoa, look at that over on the left. CH4, methane, it's already going down. Be a systems thinker. We haven't done anything in agriculture or wastewater, landfills, rice, cows, haven't touched them. How is it going? I'm gonna look in, in chat. Someone's gonna get this. Uh, lots of methane is emitted from landfills, says Susan. Yes, that is true. That remains, that methane remains here. The tax on gas, says Cliff. Gas, Laura, exactly, from gas. So a huge source of methane, basically natural gas is methane gas. So when you produce it, it leaks, it gets flared. There's a lot that comes up. So if we have a carbon price and if we highly tax gas, that industry is smaller, it is moving less gas around the world, we're getting less leakage and from other fossil fuels. So huge contribution already right there. And if we can address it from landfill and cattle, wastewater, rice, all the way down to two degrees. This would be a huge contribution. So we're at two. What else needs to be done? Well, let's see what remains. There's a really cool graph. If you click on the miniature graphs, I'm gonna get us back here to energy. Click on the miniature graphs. This one is a stacked graph of all the sources. And I wanna, well, I wanna show us um, where it was before. When we started this whole thing, here's where it was. So under the baseline, look at that same graph. This is what would send us to 3.6. Land use CO2 in green, energy CO2, burning coal, oil, and gas. F gases, methane on top of it, nitrogen, N2O from fertilizer. This is where it was a minute ago or when we started this exercise, here's where it is now. Look at that amazingly small wedge of uh, energy CO2 and methane, that gets us to two degrees. That little wedge at the bottom or that flat area of green is land use CO2. If we're able to cut that, that's another 0.1 degree. Great, we're at 1.9. I'm gonna say in chat, type in chat, what else do we need to do? 
Well, actually, Tao Dong says, does this account for methane and permafrost? Yes. I got to grab this one. So this is one of those assumptions that you can actually change. Tau, if you go under here, methane emissions from biological activity, effective temperature of methane emissions from permafrost. So you can change the strength of that effect. Yes. So what are people saying? Electrification, 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 and carbon removal. So what if we get more electrification? Now, at its best, what it would affect ideally is that wedge of red oil. We're still burning some oil. Can we electrify more in transport? Will that happen? help much more? Let's see, 1.9. Yep, you're right, it gets another 0.1. But at this point, to get down to the goal of 1.5, what, what modelers do is we've imagined some things that don't really exist in the world yet, particularly around carbon removal and for perhaps growing trees for the first thing we tried. So say we brew a modest amount of trees. I'm gonna bring up that graph of the carbon removal, technological carbon removal. There are five different types here that you can look at. You can imagine bioenergy, grow trees, burn trees, take the energy and then capture the carbon and shove it underground somewhere into limestone. There are these direct air capture, these machines that are like kind of dehumidifiers for the air. They pull out carbon dioxide, shove it underground. Crush up rocks, mineralization that absorb carbon. One that has a lot of co-benefits is ag soil carbon. If we, don't toil, if we don't till the soil, we capture more of the carbon. So let's crank this up. What if we imagine that one? 1.7. At this point, we're imagining maybe biochar, another approach, maybe something around direct air capture. But note, we don't know how to do these things yet. But if we had them, maybe these would be things that if we did, they would get us down to 1.5. There's no silver bullet. It's still possible. It's still possible with what you might call silver buckshot. Bill McKibben said that the first time, I think. There's no silver bullet. It's silver buckshot. It's still possible. And what we just saw is the highest priority actions that are absolutely necessary are keeping coal, oil, and gas in the ground, directly or indirectly. Those are the highest priority because those are the things, it's coal, oil, and gas that has caused this problem. No silver bullet, silver buckshot, it's still possible. Highest priority around keeping coal, oil, and gas in the ground. And along the way, there are so many equity considerations that we don't just implement climate policy. We need to think about the effect on people around the world and ideally do what we call multi-solve. Dr. Beth Sawin, the co-founder of our organization, and coined that word to talk about the policies that to do two things at the same time, cutting coal, helping the climate, improving air quality, improving air quality. For example, look under impacts. Oh my gosh, what would happen to air quality under this future? I'm moving too fast. How do I not see air? There it is, air pollution from energy. Consider how much better our air could be. I've seen it in Beijing and New Delhi. It is very damaging to people. It is killing people. One in 10 deaths around the world, says the World Health Organization, is due to air pollution from fossil fuels. Look how much better and how soon it gets better. Other benefits to this kind of world. And I'm gonna send you this link. Go look yourself. When I copy this scenario, I'm going to send it to you in chat. Go look with me at some of the other impacts other than air quality. Um, the one that gets me back to <laughs> this is what it looks like to divert the comet, my friends. Under the baseline future, the decrease in crop yield from temperature for wheat. 17%, maize, 21%. This is what it looks like, rice, 9%. This is what it looks like for a comet to hit Earth because 
Well, at the same time is we could have a 21% drop in crop yield. It's hard to look at and it just breaks my heart to see it. But at the same time, we're talking about this. We're talking about here we are at what today, 7.8 billion people, 7.9. By the time we have that world of 17% or 21% drop in these crop yields, we're up here at 11. More people feeding more people, crop yield going down. Now compare that, going back to impacts and crop yield, compare that to what could happen if we divert this comet. In that 1.5 degree scenario, maize only 6%, wheat only 5%. It's worse. Note, you know, the world, we, we, have, we have committed ourselves to some of this warming. We have committed ourselves to some of these impacts, but we can avoid so many. Think of biodiversity. Think of what is happening in the world under some of these scenarios, the baseline, look at the black ones for invertebrates. Here's mammals, 28%, other mammals like us, a 28% of, excuse me, these are the number of species losing more than half of their climatic range, as in it's too hot for these animals to thrive, or these invertebrates or vertebrates or damsels and dragonflies. Look at the huge difference for invertebrates. These are part of the web of life of which we are in an intimate part. We can do so much better if we get on track for this kind of scenario. So I ask you, my friends, I'm gonna be silent. I just, I'm stop talking. For 60 seconds, what would you love about being part of a world like this? Being on track to creating a world like this. Turning on my phone, I'm gonna stop, I'm gonna, 60 seconds, let's be silent. What would you love about being part of a world on track to making something like this happen? A minute can feel very long <laughs> given the right context. So please go to poll everywhere. What would you love about being part of a world on track to making something like this happen? Not exactly this. Clean air, biodiversity bouncing back. Janet, can you read some of these? I'm my voice is going. Sure. The spirit of cooperation, um, less death, quieter. Um, some from the chat, removing existential dread from the back of my brain. I would love my grandchildren would meet some of the animals that live with us today. I'd be able to die knowing my grandkids could still thrive. Um, the gratitude of future generations instead of shame, a more peaceful, just world. A planet that survives for future generations, avoid the metaphorical comet, a legacy of harmony. Um, be calm, enjoy, live well. Um, squirrels, satisfaction, we saved future generations. Yeah, these are really wonderful. We can Not do so much better. We can do so much better. These are really beautiful. Thank you. This is, we can do so much better. 
So it really prompts this question. Just here you are, we've offered this tool. It may be useful, but it may have nothing to do with your answer to this. What are you gonna do? What, what, what calls you as the role that you might play in making something like this happen? Now note, collective action will be necessary. There was an IEA study that 11% of the results can be done with individual action. So I encourage you, what could being part of collective action on earth look like? Enable MBAs as change agents, spread the word, spread this tool with educators, keep learning, use the simulation in your teaching, give your more students more time on En-ROAD, the whole semester instead of two weeks, Wow, two weeks is great. Bring those questions to my students. Telling, my, telling people to look up, talk to each other. Can you read some, Janet? Yeah. Um, encourage others to get outside and value nature. Work on developing a curriculum for using En-ROADS. Uh, share this tool to advance in awareness. Keep up my work with Citizens Climate Lobby. Keep calling my legislators. Share En-ROADS with, with high school and college students. Show this tool to legislators and to as many people as I can. Do my best to increase climate and energy literacy. Yeah, increase Wonderful. my local activism. Be elected to change the policy, absolutely. Wonderful. These are just beautiful. Thank you, everybody. and. Maybe this just sets up Janet. Um, maybe your action is outside of this world of using En-ROADS. If it's not, Janet, tell us a little bit about the training program and then maybe uh, some examples of you and, and others who are using the simulator. Yeah, so we have created this great training program. It's free, just like um, all of our tools are free. You can go to learn.climateinteractive.org and we have videos, um, we've kept them short, we've kept them in a few minutes in length, um, and we have quizzes and just more information so you can learn how to um, use the simulator and really build over time and build your capacity to help other people engage with this tool. So I encourage you to check that out. Uh, I know we have a lot of facilitators on our call today, um, our En-ROADS Climate Ambassadors, and um, just like me, they, they have kind of done the training and practiced over time, done workshops with you know, their family, um, their local communities. I recently did a workshop with the museum here in North Carolina. Um, I followed that up by doing showing En-ROADS to my eight-year-old niece. And I'll have uh -huh. to say that was the more difficult audience, but she really <laughs> loved it, you know, um, because it's interactive and she, she got to experiment and explore. Um, and so I, I want to introduce one of our stellar En-ROADS climate ambassadors, um, Bartholomew Michelon, or Michelon, and he's going to um, tell us um, about his experience with En-ROADS and how he has used it. So you should be able to speak. Yes, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. So quite uh, briefly, yes, I'm Bob uh, here from Mexico. I have been using En-ROADS uh, for some of my courses in the Tech de Monterrey in Mexico, mostly to international relations students. And it has proved to be a very useful tool in order to raise awareness, not only about climate change itself, but also about the policies that could and should be implemented against this phenomenon. And it is especially relevant for international relations students to talk about uh, policies uh, as well as their different degrees of feasibility and effectiveness. And in order to adapt to the online format that has become the rule in the past semesters, I have created an online space on a platform, uh, on a platform called uh, Gather Town in order to make the whole activity more appealing and more original. And this was the product of a joint effort with Iske, an En-ROAD ambassador uh, from the Netherlands. And so uh, on this platform, uh, participants are like on a video game. 
uh, they move their own customized characters to interact still with camera and microphone with other participants. And since you can easily share your own screen, it is very easy to organize the whole activity around the En-ROADS uh, software. And in fact, I'm going to, to send uh, through the chat uh, two pictures of um, this uh, online uh, space. Great. Uh, and so, yeah, using this alternative platform mean, uh, was an effective means to avoid the Zoom fatigue. Uh, <laughs> the students felt empowered to move from one negotiating area to, an, uh, to another negotiating area. And they experienced the more real and authentic interaction with the other participants. And they are also more likely to remember the activity itself and uh, the key message. Wonderful. So fantastic. Great to meet you. I'd seen the pictures of the Gather Town uh, last year. They were just so cool to see the innovation, people out there doing new things and extending it. It's just fantastic work. Thank you for sharing it. Um, Welcome. I thought what I'd do is share some other images of and other people. I hope you can see yourself in some of these stories, everybody, as you think of how you might make a difference with some of these tools. So I hope you can see my screen and maybe if you can pin or spotlight again, Yazzie, what I'm presenting here, but here are all the people around the world who have self-reported events that they've led. Just last week, John Sturman at MIT and Florian Kottmeyer presented this and ran a workshop with Jim Hageman Snabe former CEO of SAP, so a guy running a corporation who said that all business leaders and policy leaders should experience En-ROADS because it was one of the most inspiring concert conversations he's ever had on the topic. Uh, Samuel in Nigeria targeted youth policy makers and the local government. Uh, Anna and her team, this amazing group, three women in Russia, run 37 En-ROADS games, 970 participants including IKEA, SAP, and Nestle. We haven't met Zulfa Rashid. Maybe you're here today, but from the UAE, you wrote us with a quote saying that you had used this uh, and enjoyed the model. And Brian Laviolette and Mauritius, it was such an amazing experience to do the game with secondary level students. I'm just brushing over these quickly because I want to end the time, but Here's a quick one. Oh, Ratna Lubis was in the morning, 7 a.m. session. And she appreciated using it in Indonesia. Okay, so just to wrap up this experience, we brought you in and asked, what are some low leverage things that are out there that you've seen? And we come across this long journey that leads us to, there's no silver bullet. There is silver buckshot. There are possibilities for getting there. We can still do it. The highest priority should be on keeping coal, oil, and gas in the ground through various policies that get us there. Equity matters. And along the way, we need to consider it as we design policy, and we need to make sure we capture co-benefits as we do it. And there are things that we love about this scenario that leads all of us to want to do everything we can to make it happen. We're providing this tool for free out there in the world, 13 languages. If you're from another country, use it. Use it to make a big difference in the world or just use these insights that we came to today. We hope that they sunk in and they're actionable for you. Let us know how it goes do become an En-ROADS Climate Ambassador. And if you are one, be sure to register your events to put your pin on that map. You can do this. Go get them, everybody. Do stick around if you want to hear some questions being answered or talk some more. Overall, go get them. Bye-bye. Okay. We're going to see. We'll get some people falling away. We had 140 just now, but I assume some people will drop off. Those who didn't, um, we'd love to answer some more questions. I opened up the Q&A, um, and I think, Yazzie, you've been looking closely at them, or Janet. Um, 
Yeah, I have some I've um, kind of grabbed during the webinar. Great. Um, yeah, go ahead. You yeah. want to read some that you, I could start with? Yeah. So one of the first ones is uh, from John Keller. He asks, Andrew, how do you stay so enthusiastic when climate is such a depressing topic? <laughs> uh, how do I... You know, I'm going to ascribe 75% of how I do that to just physiology. I've got this weird relationship with serotonin and cameras. So I just, I just, if I see that dot and I think you're out there and someone's listening, I am just on. Um, the other 25% is just the practice that actually go take the course because I talk about it a lot that I learned from my mentor, Danella Meadows, who wrote the books right here. She was my professor when I was 19 years old in my undergraduate studies. And she introduced me to the ideas from Robert Fritz, who was an artist who got to Peter Senge and put this idea into the fifth discipline, another book up there about the practice of holding out a vision of what you want, being honest, and I'm getting a little prop here, being honest about the world that is, your current reality. It makes me cry every time I think about it. It is so dear. Um, being holding out the vision of what you want. Like when you guys wrote about the world that you want to see and what you would love about it, it's that. It's like, I would love this. So, and I know I want a world that works for everybody so badly. And when I can be honest, and I know I'm not lying to myself, like, oh, it'll be fine. That kind of Pollyanna thinking. No, if I'm being honest about it, I feel the tension of this rubber band. And I hold that tension and it just like, okay, we're getting up today. The last 25% of my ability to stay enthusiastic is the practice of just for myself, holding the tension between the world that I want, the messed up world that is that we see every day. So it's practice, 75% that. Okay, um, what else you got? Yeah, thank you, And Drew. feel free to answer any that you see as well that you want to capture that you want to tackle. Yeah. So Steve asked earlier, um, I love the En-ROAD simulator and it's a heavy tool. What are effective, short, light ways to, of using it to its best advantage? Like, should you use screenshots of various scenarios or what? It's a heavy tool. How to use it to your advantage. Um, yeah. So. I think it's this, it, how to bet, do you use screenshots or something? No, 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 no. Um, use it interactively, use it interactively, but use it more modestly. You'll notice, you're looking at the interface, right? This interface, Ellie Johnston, Robert Klein, Travis, and we all sat down and designed this thing. The use case was a bright eighth grade student could create a scenario below two degrees within 10 minutes without any prompting and not typing in any numbers. And we tested that and it can be used. Never leave the screen, never leave the screen and have a simple, straightforward, modest conversation the first 10 times with increasing complexity as you learn more. But you can just come to the screen. Look at this. Look at this. You down at the bottom. You don't need to talk about uh, a tax of dollars per kilowatt hour. You don't need to explain what a kilowatt hour is. You basically get to say tax it or subsidy using those words, and then just talk about the things that people are thinking about. Oh yeah, eating less meat, not chopping down trees. Ask them to together with you. See if they can create, give them the mouse and create a zero or a 
get below two degrees scenario. So just don't leave the screen, keep it modest, and you can hit some basic things. There's no silver bullet, right? You see at that really quickly. There's no one thing you can touch here that gets you under two degrees. It is silver buckshot. It takes hitting many of these things in order to hit below two degrees. And then they will notice that if you're not taking action over here with coal, oil, and gas, uh, you're not getting close. They'll get that fourth point. So keep it simple and then start building up. There's my answer. All right. What else? Yeah. So Michael asks, how often do you update this model as new science comes out? Um, yeah. Do you think you can keep the pace going? <laughs> so great question. And I just opened up, uh, I could show where it is, but if you go under here under help and you click on release notes, you will see that kind of every other month we're releasing a new version of the model. And so January, 2022, you can see in the December, 2021, there'll be translations, but uh, also, well, the science is changing. We're about to change. There's uh, the new IPCC report just had some interesting insights about sea level rise. There's gonna be some good news coming out soon. Sea level rise is not as bad as we thought it was because of some of the new science. So every month, every other month, can we keep up the pace? I'm glad you asked. Um, I'm in the middle of an effort to, with our prospectus, raise a good bit of money to hire the amazing professionals like Janet and Yazzie and our modeling team in order to keep up with the science and keep improving it. If anybody out there knows somebody who wants to be part of this movement by providing resources. You know, we're aiming at getting this tool to thousands of people around the world to engage leaders, top decision makers, citizens, business. We have big goals and uh, join us. That's, that's how we'll do it. What are other, I see one on yeah. hydrogen. There's a lot of talk on hydrogen. We are going to add it as a carrier of energy. Note that people talk about it as if it's an energy source. It is not an energy source. You have to do something to create the hydrogen that will you be using as an energy carrier. It can come from natural gas burning a fossil fuel. It can come from wind and solar. There are many ways to make it, but uh, nuclear, um, note that it, again, won't be a silver bullet. Other. <clears throat> yeah. So Steve asks, has En-ROADS managed to avoid being politicized? Do conservatives and Republicans in the US acknowledge the value and believe in its fairness? What a good question. Um, overall, do there's no Republicans in the US. There are many individuals. And um, I'm happy that there have been several Republicans who have spoken up about what they've appreciated about En-ROADS. I mentioned just a minute ago, the campaign, one of our campaigns is to include more people with a conservative kind of more market-based approach of thinking to addressing climate change. One of them is Representative John Curtis from Utah, who said what he likes about En-ROADS is it can support a really thoughtful conversation, you can see ways that policy action could be worth the pain. This is me and him uh, before breakfast at a conference. He asked to spend even more time after he saw it in a presentation. So um, he was one who really saw the value of a science-based conversation. Also, Mitt Romney, when he gave an interview to the Milken Institute about why he thinks there should be a carbon price, he said, and I quote, there is a professor at MIT, that's John Sturman, co-developer of this model with us, who put together a model because we spent a lot of time with him and his team that allows you to sit down and say, I'm gonna make changes in technology and regulation <coughs> and pricing and taxes 
and see what impact it has. <coughs> Anyhow, he liked a carbon price. He quoted En-ROADS as a way to do it. So it's working really well. And I encourage anybody out there to try to have a conversation with people who see the world differently from you. <coughs> Excuse me. Other questions? Yeah, well said. So Judith asks, how do we address the fact that En-ROADS is a global tool and to get to the desired results, actions really need to be taken on a global scale? <clears throat> okay, just because En-ROADS is a global tool does not mean that actions need to be taken at a global scale. <clears throat> <clears throat> a key principle here with modeling is that every model is appropriate to its purpose. This is a global model that's built to improve our understanding of the interplay of various policies amidst this complex system. Its principles are relevant at a variety of scales. However, it's not saying we just need global action. Clearly, we're not getting it. So we're going to need to find something else. Um, so uh, there are many ways that we could get to the results that we want. Many of them involve, well, my vision of it is national action, state and provincial, business, state, local, community, individual, family. Like it's going to take multiple scales. Other questions, Janet? Yeah, maybe we'll just take a couple more and preserve your voice. Um, let's see. How do, when you're, um, when you're doing an En-ROADS workshop, um, how do you talk about equity and environmental justice um, when there isn't, you know, a lever for that? Yeah. Great question. And boy, it'd be cool. Yazzie, if you're able to find on YouTube, there's that video that we shot for the multi-solving part of the Mastering En-ROADS training that is part of our training. So the basic answer is go take the training and one of the trainings is how to do this. What I would encourage you to think about is, well, doing what I just did was maybe half of what we can do or two thirds of it. You'll notice framed the goal of this around climate and equity. It's important that it's the goal and then pull out various questions. So before we put in that afforestation policy, I asked, what are the equity considerations? When we did the carbon price policy, and we had time to really talk about them, what are the, just ask. Educate yourself as a facilitator, but then ask. Then in the model, you can pull forward things that have been quantified. And the things that have been quantified are around air quality, which is a, excellent environmental justice indicator, particularly for urban environmental issues all around the world, air quality. Land use, food, displacement around nature-based climate solutions is an excellent one as well. We find that those two hooks, and mind you, you don't need 50 topics. You need two, three, or four good ways to get into the conversation and have people realize, wait, I can't just fix the climate problem. I need to think about a variety of issues because we're trying to help people in life on earth, including things that have nothing to do with the problem of rising temperature around the world. That's just a short answer, but there's a longer video that trains you all in it. Oh, I guess the third one, you heard me talking about energy prices. That's another really good one uh, that shows, like, addresses socioeconomic inequity um, and addresses that one. So, yeah, air quality, land use, food, energy prices. Great. And I see it is 316. Drew, how are you feeling? <clears throat> Do you want to take a couple more questions or um, yeah. call it a day? Okay. Um, so Steve asks, for a novice presenter, even after extensive training, many will insist on challenging the science, assumptions, et cetera. How do you handle that without really getting sucked into the swamp? 
Yeah. So again, I'll say, go to the advanced facilitation section of the course, because this is something we talk about a good bit. <clears throat> and um, I think the key thing here, I've been running these workshops for 20 years, and I just noticed the moment when you can tell that what's being talked about is not the topic that's being talked about. So uh, sometimes you'll get that intuition that the words that are coming out of people's mouths is your parameters, climate science, the model, garbage in, garbage out. The lines that you hear are just questioning you as you say, getting sucked into the swamp. And you wanna be clear about what you understand of the model. You wanna direct people to the right resources. But sometimes you're not answering what's really going on. And so there, <clears throat> and I've done this a few times, it's a gamble. But if you come to this from a, from a really grounded, honest, caring, respectful place, it can work. So I remember a time when someone was asking all the questions and I had answered them well and said, my five reasons that how we build confidence in the model, but I was getting sucked into the swamp and I just had to say something different. And I think it was, there was a guy who was just coming at me so hard and I had to say, name my own experience. Gary, I'm hearing you ask more questions about these things about the model and I can't, this thought, keeps coming to my mind and I can't get rid of it. So I'm just gonna say it. Like, I keep wondering if there's something else that we all wanna be talking about that isn't about the model. Uh, I'm just curious, is, like, what's on your mind? What do you really think about all this? And something to authentically name what, what do you think is going on? Not to put them on the spot, like, I think you're trying to bust me or something like that. And mind you, this happens very rarely in my experience, but just to be honest, like what's really going on? And Gary was like, I just don't want to think about taking the thing, actions that you're talking about. And I was like, great, <laughs> I get it. I hear you, say more. And it really just changed the whole vibe in the room. Another time I had to say, you know, Sally, I just don't know what to do with the energy you've got because Sally was just on fire with her questions and people laughed and they're like, they didn't either. Like how to name your true experience and, and try to talk about what's really going on. So that's what you have to do. Answer clearly and then get curious if you can ask what might really be going on. Takes a lot of practice, but it tends to work. Uh, it's never really failed on me when I just talk authentically and say, I don't know what to say. I'm curious to ask this question. So there it is. Others. Can yeah, I try I to show the solutions for ministry of the future? Oh my God, that whole financial scheme that that guy came up with. When I read the book and I only got two thirds of the way through, I couldn't handle it. I just, I ran out of steam, but no, we can't do it on this dashboard yet. Um, others that you saw, Janet? Yeah, um, someone's asking about the car. If you um, have a carbon price and then in En-ROADS and then you also apply like a coal or natural gas tax, isn't there a redundancy or overlap yeah. or something going on? If you apply carbon tax and a gas tax, is there redundancy? No, they add on top of each other. So we do the math right there. Now, mind you, you're gonna get decreasing returns at some point, right? You, you, you can only, like, if you make coal so expensive, it won't be built as much. No, but we're not double counting, nor we're doing that, the math adding up correctly, fortunately. Um, why are natural variations not included? Oh, they are. 
So um, we have En-ROADS Pro, which is the full model that's on in, so, in software called Benson. And in it, we explicitly model uh, black carbon uh, volcanoes like the one that happened just recently. Uh, that's in there. So they are explicitly modeled, but uh, we saw no reason to add them to the dashboard to change in the future because we can't affect them. So we've only included things that we can affect, but they do affect the model. One of the reasons that the temperature is what does, like to get, to track the historical temperature in the model, we had to include them and we had to do, uh, and like, we're gonna have to, well, we have to include them over time. So I'm gonna go, so if you go here to En-ROADS and you look um, under the main, if you go to model comparison historical, you see here temperature history, um, you see, you see these lines are the NASA temperature data, the Met Office temperature data in pink. That's the actual data with the national natural variability, okay? This is what temperature really did from 1990 to 2019. And then you see the simulated black line. Now, how did it go down that much? I think that's Pinatubo. So we had to exogenously, as we say, inject sulfate aerosols into the stratosphere. And mind you, in the model, in En-ROADS, we're able to model uh, sulfate aerosols in the stratosphere that affects radiative forcing that gave us that drop in temperature to track this. So we do bring natural variability. And gosh, I wonder, I guess we're going to have to do it again the next time we make this graph. If I don't know how much the temperature decreases from this last uh, uh, volcano. Others that you see? Yeah, I think we have time for one more. Um... What, what is your opinion about the levers that are most likely to build political will? What are the levers that are most likely to build political will? Like that political as in governments are most willing to encourage. Yeah, well, what have governments been willing to do over the last 10, 20 years? Uh, you know, so wind and solar, like subsidizing, like research and development and adoption of wind and solar, many governments around the world have been able to support. Many energy efficiency, right? We see a lot going on with encouraging energy efficiency with rebates and with standards for various things. Electrification, because of some of the economic development possibilities. We see a lot of interest in that, electrification. There's a big push in bioenergy. We don't think it's a, a great push, but we've seen a lot of that lately. Um, those, that's my top, what do you, well, Janet, you, you watch this stuff too. You got others on the list? What, any other that come to mind for you? Yeah, I think, um... Someone, Ian, in the chat said um, things that encourage jobs. <laughs> yeah. I would definitely agree. Yeah. Energy efficiency, um, definitely. It's not, I don't know, it's not the bright, shiny thing, but yeah. it makes such a huge difference. Right. Great. Well, let's declare victory, everybody. It's been an hour and a half of all this. And um, go take the course. If you already run the workshops, Tell us about them, report, register your events, write a little note, put your pin on that map and say, I've run this event around the world. Share it with other people, write about it on Twitter, get the word out. This is a growing community that is gonna have more and more impact in line with the vision that we have. Greenhouse gas emissions falling rapidly with equitable policies. Go get them everybody, bye-bye.